The passage for the sermon this morning is in Romans chapter 10. If you would turn with me there, Romans 10 verses 14 through 17. Again, Romans 10, 14 through 17, please pay attention to the reading of God's holy and true word. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Let's pray. O Lord, we do pray that you would speak to us that we may speak. In the midst of all of the voices in our world that bombard us constantly, it is your voice that we need to hear. We thank you that you have spoken to us in your word. So help us to hear. Give us ears by your spirit to hear your word truthfully. Make your word as it has been read and it is about to be preached in effectual means to convert and convince lost sinners, to build us up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Lord, speak to us that we may speak. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Have you ever wanted to see a tornado? Maybe I should ask the question, has anybody here ever seen a tornado? A couple? All right. As a child, I always wanted to see a tornado. A couple times I got lucky enough to see a funnel cloud, but I really never got to see the real thing. Now, if you wanted to see a tornado, where would you go? Now, technically, tornadoes can happen just about anywhere. Tornadoes can happen in La Crosse, Wisconsin, but I'm guessing they're not very common here. They're not common in southern Wisconsin where I grew up, down by Janesville. They're not common in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where I live now, or Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where I'm going. And I don't think La Crosse is some exception in the state of Wisconsin for tornado frequency. So if you wanted to see a tornado, where would you go? Do you know that there is a place in the United States called Tornado Alley? In uh, the kind of the central plains of the United States, Oklahoma, North Texas, Kansas, Arkansas? Do you know that there's a specific time of year when tornadoes are most likely to happen? Late spring and early summer. So if you want to see a tornado, you could stay here in La Crosse and wait for the rest of your life, and you might just get lucky enough to see one, or unlucky enough if you're deathly afraid of tornadoes. But if you really wanted to see a tornado, go to North Texas in the month of May, keep your eye on the weather radar, and go near the biggest storm you can find, and you might just see a tornado. I've heard someone say that God is like tornadoes, in that way at least. That God can work in any way that he chooses to work. God can work in many different ways and in many different places. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is a sovereign God. Yet, There are also certain places, certain activities where God has promised to be found. Places where God has promised to meet with his people and work amongst his people. I know assumptions are very dangerous things to make, but I'm going to assume that you are here this morning because you desire to know God. Either you don't know God and you think that church is a good place for you to be to learn more about him, Or you do know God and you think that corporate worship is the place where you should meet God and see him work powerfully in you. And in either case, I'm here to tell you that you're in the right place. Again, there are certain places and activities where God has promised to meet us. In the Reformed tradition, we speak of these things as the ordinary means of grace. The word of God as it is read and it is preached. The sacraments. Baptism in the Lord's Supper, and prayer. 
I think that sometimes we overcomplicate the Christian life. We look for things that are flashy. We look for things that are extraordinary and fancy, all the while being tempted to neglect the beauty and the power of the simple, the ordinary, the rhythms and habits of the Christian life. If you want to meet with God, if you want to know him, if you want to see him work in La Crosse and in our world, then commit yourself to those simple and ordinary things that God has given us to do. This morning, I want to look at just one of those ordinary means with you, the preaching of God's word. If you want to see a tornado, go to North Texas or Oklahoma in the month of May. If you want to meet with God, go to church where his word is read and preached. We're going to look at three aspects of preaching this morning from Romans chapter 10. The necessity of faithful preaching, the necessity of faithful preachers, and the necessity of faithful hearers. Preaching, preachers, and hearers. So let's look first at the necessity of faithful preaching. If you have your Bibles open to Romans 10, look one verse before the passage that I read for us. Look at verse 13. Paul quotes here from Joel chapter 2. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a simple statement. It's right at the heart of the Christian faith and the gospel that we believe. That salvation comes by calling upon the name of the Lord. It comes by faith in Jesus Christ, not by our efforts or our activities or our works in any way, but by the simple act of calling upon our Savior in faith. In our passage then, in verses 14 through 17, Paul follows up on that simple statement by addressing how someone actually comes to the point of calling upon this Savior, Jesus Christ. If salvation is by calling upon the Lord, how does someone actually come to that point of calling upon the Lord and being saved? Look at verses 14 and 15. He actually begins by asking, That question, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Notice the repeated words that Paul uses. He repeats the phrases and individual words two times. What he's doing in a way is linking together chain links of thought. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? But what's interesting about this chain link that Paul constructs here is that he starts at the end of the chain and works to the beginning. He doesn't start at the beginning and work to the end. He begins with the end result, calling upon the name of the Lord. And he says, what are the steps whereby someone gets to the point of calling upon the name of the Lord. They need to believe. They need to hear. Someone needs to preach. A preacher needs to be sent. This past summer, I spent a day helping one of the elders at Livingstone Church, PCA in Oshkosh, uh, helped him build a playset for his kids in his backyard. Uh, in my mind, it was kind of like constructing a large Lego set And I personally think that Legos, until you step on a piece, are the best toy ever invented. And I would be willing to argue with anybody on that point after the service if you have strong opinions. So for me, it felt like grown-up Legos. We took all of the pieces, we had the directions, we arranged the boards by their various lengths, the different nuts and bolts that we needed to use to construct it. And once we had all of this stuff laid out, and looked at the directions, we were able to put together piece by piece this playset. It still took us a few hours. I'm not the most handy person in the world. But eventually we got it put together, and we got it put together right. But I'm probably like many of you, where my tendency is not always to follow the directions. I think that's a classic fault of men and husbands. We look at the directions from that piece of furniture from Ikea, and we think, I see the end picture. I think I can put that together my own way. 
And what happens when you get about halfway through and you realize, I used the wrong length bolt on this piece and now I need that longer bolt over here. You have to actually tear the whole thing apart and put it back together. You don't end up saving time by skipping the directions. You actually add time to the work of putting together whatever you were building. Now, in a way, Paul here is giving us a step-by-step process that we would be wise to listen to. This isn't to make evangelism this overly formulaic thing, where if you just follow these few simple steps, you will always get a conversion at the end. That's not how this works. But it is to say that if we want to engage in God's work in the world and evangelism, we should care about the way that God has designed things to work. We are so tempted often in the work of evangelism and ministry, in the work of the church, to do it in the way that we think works best. We like our own tactics. We like to say, this makes the most sense to my mind. But instead, we ought to listen to our God. We should say, what things has God told us to do? And how can we be faithful in those often simple and non-seemingly extraordinary things? And then trust that God will do his work in his way and in his time. And when we ask the question, how has God directed us to engage in our work as the church? What has he called us to do? One of the most basic and simple answers is that we must preach. We must preach. Look at verse 17. So faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Preaching is necessary because hearing is necessary. Preaching is necessary because preaching is a means of God bringing salvation to our world. Or as the Westminster Shorter Catechism so helpfully says in the answer to question 89, the question is, how is the word made effectual to salvation? The answer is, the Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Have you ever paid attention to that little phrase, but especially the preaching in the answer there in the Shorter Catechism. Not only the word read, but the word preached is the means that God has deemed whereby the Spirit would convince and convert sinners and build up his people. Preaching is necessary because it is a means of salvation, but it's also necessary for a second reason. And this second reason might not be so obvious at a first reading of the passage. Preaching is necessary, secondly, because preaching is where the voice of Jesus is heard. Preaching is where the voice of Jesus is heard. Look again at the middle of verse 14. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Now, if you have an ESV translation, look at the footnote given for that verse. The footnote reads, or him whom they have never heard. So the ESV really gives two options for translating this verse. Is it how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, or how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? Now to simplify it for you, the the difference here is, is this. Are we hearing of Jesus Or are we hearing Jesus? It's actually a fairly significant difference. It's not to say that in hearing the gospel we don't hear about Jesus, because we do hear about Jesus. But is Paul intending to say something one step further than that? That in the preaching of the gospel, the voice of Jesus is actually heard. And I think that second translation is actually better. When we hear faithful preaching, we actually hear our God speak. I think this becomes clearer to us when we actually listen to the words of Jesus himself in a couple of passages in the Gospels. First, Luke 10, 16. Jesus sends out his disciples to preach. And what does he tell his disciples as he sends them out? 
He said, the one who hears you hears me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. The one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. That first phrase from Jesus as he called his disciples to preach, the one who hears you hears me. Second, in John chapter 10, 14 through 16, a a passage that you are likely quite familiar with, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also. Listen to what he says next. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is here speaking about the gospel going to the world, the bringing in of the Gentiles into the people of God through the proclamation of the gospel. And here's a piece of uh, a trivia for you. When in the New Testament do we see in large numbers the, the Gentiles being brought into the church? Is it before or after the ascension of Jesus into heaven? It's after the ascension of Jesus. So how can it be that Jesus says when these sheep are brought into his flock that they will listen to his voice? It's as the gospel goes out through preaching in the book of Acts that the voice of the shepherd is heard by his people. And they are called by their shepherd into his flock. To bring it closer to home to you, maybe, if you have heard the gospel and you have responded with faith, it's not primarily because you heard the voice of your pastor. It's not primarily because you heard the voice of your parent or your friend or that college mission worker or missionary who shared the gospel with you. You responded in faith because, in a very real way, you heard the voice of Jesus. You heard the voice of your shepherd. And you recognized his voice for what it was, and the gospel message for what it was. And you responded to your shepherd with faith. When preachers faithfully preach the word of God and the gospel, Christ himself speaks his words of eternal life. And this may seem strange to us, but think for a moment about about what you pray before sermons. Do you pray, God, help us to hear Michael's voice today. God, we really need to hear from Michael. And he's a great preacher. He is. But isn't Michael that you actually need to hear when you come to church church on any given Lord's Day? Is it my voice that you really need to hear this morning? No, hopefully not, right? What you pray is actually, God, speak to us. Speak, O Lord. You sang this last week, I believe. Speak, O Lord, as we come to to you to receive the food of your holy word. Come to church expecting to hear from your God, to meet with him, to hear the voice of your Savior as the word of God and the gospel is faithfully preached. So first, we need, we need faithful preaching. Second, we see the necessity of faithful preachers. And that fl- this flows well out of that first point. This is where Paul's logical chain takes us in verses 14 and 15. He writes, how are they to hear without someone preaching? We actually need someones. We need people who preach. He says, how are they to preach unless they are sent? That sending implies people whose specific calling it is to be preachers of the gospel. We need sent ones. That's why I'm first going to apply this to pastors and to preachers. But don't shut your ears now and believe that Michael is the only one who should listen to what I say. This is actually something that you need to hear and understand as well. Preachers need to be called. Preachers need to be sent out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see that in the Old Testament with the office of the prophet. 
who were called to be God's mouthpieces to his people. We see it in the New Testament where the primary preaching that takes place in the book of Acts is the apostles and other appointed officers in the church, men like Stephen and Philip. We believe that there's a specific kind of authority that those who are called have to declare the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ as long as what they declare is in line with the word of God. This doesn't give preachers free reign to say whatever they want to say. This actually puts a great burden on preachers to say what you proclaim, you ought to have the confidence to say, thus says the Lord, because what I'm speaking is not my thoughts, because what I preach is the very word of God, and I know it is what your souls need as those who listen. This is actually an essential piece of reformed doctrine of preaching. What we believe preaching actually is that we believe that Christ speaks to his people through the preaching of his word by those that he has called. One great old and dead theologian, and most of my favorite theologians are dead, and I would commend to you to read old dead theologians. One of my favorites, Gerhardus Voss, he writes, there's a distinction in the power of the ministry of the word between mere scriptural interpretation by a private member and the official ministry of the word. God or Christ speaks to the congregation through the latter, through such who are called by him to that end. So as an application point for you, even as a whole congregation, it should be your desire to see pastors raised up, to see preachers trained and sent from this church to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a church, I know this is something you care about. You sent out Matt Klein, who was with you for a while, and Ben Leatherberry to go plant Clearwater Presbyterian Church in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. You're a part of what the Wisconsin Presbytery has been doing to train up preachers to be sent to the communities around our state so that the gospel would go forward in the state of Wisconsin. So I want to encourage you and to tell you to keep doing what you're doing to keep caring about the things that you care about. This isn't a rebuke. This is an encouragement. It ought to be an encouragement for you as a congregation that the Lord is at work. But I also do believe that this applies in important ways to all of God's people, not just to preachers. In 1 Peter 2, Peter writes, But you, the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his, for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you are one of those that our God has called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, then guess what? It is also your calling to proclaim his excellencies to the world. We should all seek to make the gospel known not just pastors, not just preachers, not just church planters and missionaries. And I love Paul's quotation from Isaiah 52, from the passage that Michael read for the Old Testament reading. At the end of verse 15, Paul here in Romans 10 quotes from Isaiah 52. He says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, if you think about that phrase for just a second, it's actually fairly odd. Beautiful feet. What on earth could Isaiah mean by this? What could Paul mean by quoting from this? Think of Paul's day, where Paul himself and other messengers of the gospel and preachers would travel widely, often by foot, in sandals. I doubt any of these traveling preachers would qualify as being people that physically and literally have beautiful feet. Paul probably would not have made a good foot model in any way, right? Yet Paul, quoting Isaiah, calls the feet of these messengers beautiful. Why does he call their feet beautiful? It's not because their actual feet were beautiful, but because of the beautiful message that their feet carried. In Isaiah 52, the picture is of a messenger running back to a city to announce the victory of a king. 
The watchmen on the walls of the city look out, over the, look out off of the wall, maybe over the plain or the rolling hills outside of their city, and they see from a long way off this messenger running back to the city, and they can see in his very gait the way that he runs with, with power and with joy, that he is bringing good news for the city, that their king has won, that their king is victorious. But in Isaiah 52, it's not just any victorious king. The victorious king is the Lord. The Lord has won. The Lord has defeated his enemies. The Lord has brought salvation for his people. And the watchmen look, they see the messenger, and they receive it with joy. How beautiful are those running feet that bring that good news back to the city. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment a car enthusiast dying of thirst out in a desert. Kind of an odd mental picture, if you think of it. I have no idea why a car enthusiast would be dying of thirst out in a desert, but just go along with me for a second. Imagine that this car enthusiast has been wandering for multiple days. He's gotten to the point where he can hardly walk. He's dragging himself along. And wouldn't you know it, he comes upon at last a road, cutting right through this desert. And wouldn't you know, two cars are driving up, one from either direction. The first car that is driving up from his right and speeding down this road is a cherry red brand new Ferrari. It's a beautiful car. It's got like 600 horsepower. The thing is shiny. It's got comfy leather seats. This is a car enthusiast's car. Coming the other direction is a 1990 Chrysler Town and Country minivan. It has spent its life in Wisconsin and for some reason is now down in the desert. And so that means it is full of rust. Everything is rattling. You don't know how this thing is still moving, but it rattles up and rumbles up from the other direction. And this car enthusiast, dying of thirst, walks out in the middle of the road. He holds out his hands. The cars come to a stop. He goes to the Ferrari. The guy rolls down his window and he begs him, Sir, I am dying. I need water. Do you have any water for me? Can you give me a ride to the nearest town? I need help. What does the driver of the Ferrari say? Do you think I have room in this tiny sports car to carry extra supplies with me? I'd, I really don't want you muddying up my brand new vehicle. I'm sorry, sir. I don't think I can help you. So he drags his way over to the rusty Chrysler town and country minivan. And this lady rolls down her window and he says, please, I need water. I am dying of thirst. Can you give me a ride to the nearest town? And she says, yeah, I think I've got a, a, a big carton of water bottles in the back here somewhere under this mess. Let me go dig around. I'm sure I can find something. And, and I, I have tons of room. Why don't you hop in? I'll put on the air conditioning if it still works and I'll get you to town. Now, this is a car enthusiast, right? But in that moment, which car was more beautiful to him? Was it the car that on any other day would have been the car of his dreams? No. The car that was beautiful to him was that little rust bucket minivan. Because that minivan carried what he so desperately needed. It carried the water that would sustain his life. It had the room to take him to the place where he needed to go so that he would survive and he would escape the world in which he had been living for the last couple of days in the desert. You can say in a way that that van was a beautiful wheeled van in the way that messengers of the gospel are beautiful footed people. Be a church full of beautiful footed people. Something you probably never thought you'd hear in a sermon in your life. Have beautiful feet. 
Are your feet beautiful? Are you a herald of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So we've seen the necessity of faithful preaching, the necessity of faithful preachers, but lastly, in this passage, we see the necessity of faithful hearers. Faithful hearers. In the larger context here in Romans 10, Paul is dealing with the question of why so many of his fellow Israelites in his day weren't saved. Why they hadn't responded with faith to the gospel. What had gone wrong? And that's actually one of the reasons he lays out this chain for us. He's saying, where did the chain break? Right? Because if you take out one link, the whole chain loses its structural integrity. I'm no engineer, but I'm smart enough to know that. So at what point did this chain fail for those who had not been saved of his fellow Israelites? Is it that preachers weren't sent? No, preachers were sent. Paul was one of them. Is it that these preachers had failed to preach? No, the preachers did preach. So did the Israelites just not hear them then? Were they preaching in the wrong location and all the Israelites were over here, but the preacher was two blocks up that way, they just didn't hear? No, they did hear. They had heard the gospel message. So what's the problem? The problem is that in hearing, they did not believe. Look at verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? They had heard, but they hadn't believed. So even as we need faithful preaching and we need faithful preachers, we need faithful hearers. You should expect Michael to spend time, significant time, preparing every week to preach. He has a responsibility before God for how he handles the Word of God and for how he feeds you with the Word of God. You also, though, as a congregation, have a responsibility for how you listen. You have a responsibility for how you hear. I love what question 90 of the Shorter Catechism, the one following the one I had quoted earlier, what it says about this. It says, how is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? And the answer is that the word may become effectual to salvation. We must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer, receive it with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. We, as hearers, need to attend to the word that we hear. Do you come prepared to hear each week? Just a couple of ideas for you. Find out what passage is being preached on the next Sunday. Ordinarily, that should be fairly easy if you're walking through books of the Bible. But know what passage is being preached. Read through it. Study through it the week before the sermon. Perhaps you could spend time on Saturday night or Saturday evening or even Sunday morning before church praying for Michael, praying for a receptive heart to receive God's word. Maybe that application point where it says lay it up in our hearts, practice it in our lives. Maybe you could write down one or two application points from each sermon every week and actively reflect on those application points and seek to practice it in your life that week. Are you a faithful hearer of God's word? But ultimately, what it means to be a faithful hearer is to hear with faith. To be someone who hears the gospel and receives and rests upon Jesus and Jesus alone as he is offered to you in that gospel. Humans have this sinful tendency towards self-justification. This was the issue in Paul's day. This is why his fellow Israelites heard but did not believe. It's because they relied upon their own works, the works of the law, their own goodness, their own obedience to justify them before God. You can actually boil it down to what Paul says earlier in this chapter in verses 3 and 4. 
for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For those who did not believe yet had heard, it's because they sought to establish their own righteousness, their own perfection, their own goodness by their own effort and their own attainments. But don't we have this same tendency in our hearts? When we are confronted with the reality of our sin from the word of God, something that we've done wrong or even a good thing that we've failed to do, isn't it true that self-justification often just pours out of us? It's this natural, sinful tendency. We try to explain away the seriousness of what we've done. We say it's really not that big of a deal. Maybe one of the more sinister ways that we establish our own self-righteousness is by comparing ourselves to those other people. We're not as bad as he is. We're not as bad as she is. And we, we puff ourselves up. We say, I'm not that bad. We seek to establish our own righteousness. Or we're confronted with our sin and we say, I'm going to do better next time. And because I do better, God will accept me. And God will love me. In Midwest fashion, we look like people who pursue self-sufficiency. We say, I don't want somebody's help. I don't need somebody's help. I'm a good Midwesterner. I grew up on a farm, or my dad owned a farm, my grandparents owned a farm. I'm right? I'm sturdy. I can do my own work. I can fix my own problems. But when we hear the voice of Jesus in the gospel, he calls us to a very different way. He tells us, you need me to do for you something that you cannot do for yourself. You need me to accomplish for you something that you can never accomplish for yourself. Because Jesus alone can make the case for your salvation. Not a case that minimizes your sin. No, but a case that takes your sin in all of its seriousness, but takes it to the cross. Not in a self-righteousness that says, I'm not as bad as that person. But instead, an honest confession of our sin that says, O oh Lord, I am a sinner and I need the righteousness of Christ desperately. Not a self-attained righteousness that says, I can work hard enough. But instead, a righteousness that is alien to us. The perfect righteousness of the only perfect one. The only perfect Savior given to us credited to us, clothing us by faith and by faith alone. It's what Louis Burkhoff, another one of my favorite dead theologians, calls an absolute transference of trust from ourselves to another. A complete self-surrender to God. I love that idea of transference of trust we must, as we hear the gospel, transfer our trust from a trust in ourselves to a trust in Jesus, our good shepherd and our only savior. So we need to listen, but we need to believe. And we even need to listen so that we will believe. Verse 17, again, faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. And again, I think this is not just the word about Christ, but Christ's own word. We believe and are saved not first because we call out to Jesus, but because Jesus calls out to us. And we hear his voice. So listen. Listen, hear Jesus, and believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are not a distant, 
far-off God who set this world spinning at creation and then leaves it. But you are a God who is near to your people. You even promise to be among us as your people gather for worship. We thank you that you are not a silent God and a mute God, but that you are a God who speaks, that you have spoken to us in your word, you have spoken to us in your Son. So again, Lord, we pray that by your Spirit, you would give us ears to hear. You would give us hearts that are receptive to your word. And then then as those that have heard the good news and have heard the gospel and have received Jesus by faith, What we sang before the sermon, Lord, may it be true. Lord, speak to us that we may speak. Oh, Father, give us beautiful feet. Help us to be heralds of the gospel wherever you put us, Lord, every one of us. We pray that many here in La Crosse, through the ministry of these people who are gathered, through the ministry of this church, that many in hearing the gospel would hear the voice of their Savior, would repent of their sins, and would trust in Jesus and in him alone for their salvation. We pray all of this for your glory, O God. Amen. Please stand together and we'll sing, 